It's episode 58 of Beyond the Track. Thanks for tuning in. This is going to be a good one. Might even be great. I think it will. It's with Connor Fields, legend in so many ways. I want to get into that legendary status. But Connor, I want to welcome you to the show. And first, right off the top, I just got to ask, how are you doing? Uh, I've watched the video a few times. I don't like watching the video. I, it was a brutal crash for you. Right off the top, man, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, I'm definitely not 100% at this point. Uh, anybody who's ever had a concussion understands that, you know, you go through a period where you're kind of low energy and you're a little bit tired as you're healing. So I'm kind of in that at the moment. You know, I still have to take a nap every afternoon and just kind of slowly improving the energy level. Um, but honestly, I'm just thankful. Like it really could have been so much worse and I'm happy to deal with a little bit of fatigue um, for a period of time. But like just the fact that I remember who I am and what's going on is, you know, your perspective changes a little bit, but yeah, I'm coming along and they say it could take up to a year to completely get back a hundred percent might be three months, might be six months with, uh, with head injuries, they just don't know. So I just got to kind of wait and see how long it takes to get back to normal. With a head injury too, I know it can go so many different ways, right? It's not like concussion means this. Concussion means a lot of things. And for some, I know you get a concussion and you, within a, an hour, you're like, God, I know what happened. I know what happened. And right. sometimes it's like, I got to see video. I don't even know. How has that been for you? Did you know what happened? Or was this like a later, like, oh my gosh, that's what happened? Um, I'm missing from about an hour before I crashed. So I remember practice like warm up that day. After that, it's blank. Um, until I woke up in the hospital five days later. So I'm missing a lot. And I watched the video and like, I have absolutely no memory of even before that, or the, we had done two races before that one that I crashed in and I don't have anything from that, but, um, up until about an hour before, like I remember breakfast that day. I remember the day before and I have all my childhood stuff, but it's just that that kind of that five day window is, is gone. When you look back on the trip, then I guess it's obviously the Olympics. You're there for a reason. You're there to win, represent. And when you have a crash like that, that kind of takes you out of it. Um, is there a disappointment feeling just because of how it all ended up going or do you still look at the entire experience of being there and being who you are and everything you've worked for as like, this was still on a macro level, um, you know, a, a great, not a great experience, but it, like you're proud of everything you did to that point and you can look past it and go, okay, I'm gonna come back and get it again. Or do you look at it like, man, all the work was a waste. Like, how do you process when an injury or a crash kind of upsets maybe the trajectory of where you were going that week? Um, I would say both, if that makes sense. So this was a unique Olympics for sure in that it's the only one in history that's ever been postponed. Um, mm -hmm. And then everything we had to go through last year when uh, my gym was shut and the tracks were shut and I had to figure out how to keep training. And then for a long time, we didn't really know if the Olympics was actually going to happen. Like it was on the schedule and they said it was going to happen, but it was touch and go for a while. Um, so there's a lot of things you had to work through. And then you add on top of that, being the defending champion is significantly harder than just going in and having nothing to quote unquote lose. Um, so I'm definitely proud of, of the preparation. And, and I've always, as an athlete, I've always believed like you can't always control the outcome, especially in a sport like BMX or in moto, you know, it's the same sort of thing. You can have a mechanical, you can, someone can hit you, you can have a freak accident happen but you can control the prep. Um, and I did everything I possibly could. And, you know, I was performing well and I definitely had a chance to win. Um, but then at the same time, just like in moto, there's always that chance of a freak accident happening. And there's always that slim, slim chance of a, of a bad injury taking place. And we kind of accept that that's a risk. You kind of go into it knowing like, all right, there's a 0.001% chance that I could get really hurt and you choose to do it anyway. Some people don't, but you know, we choose to do it anyway. Um, so I always knew it was a slim possibility. Uh, 
So yeah, I guess to answer a bit of both, I'm proud of the preparation and the fact that I went to three Olympics and um, even like I qualified for the final, even with that happening. And I'm the only rider in history that's made three Olympic finals. Uh, no one else has done that. So that's a period of 12 in the Olympic cycle is four years. That's 12 years that I've been one of the eight best riders in the world. So that's a you know, pretty cool thing to be proud of. But then at the same time, like, obviously it sucks because. Because you want to win. <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't, to that win. I didn't go there to not at least give it a proper, proper crack. Right. Right. So it makes sense. Positives and negatives. Obviously I, I want to get into the mental side of things with you too, because I know you, um, approach the mental side of being an athlete a little bit different. And I know you have some relationships that are pretty cool. So, uh, but I want to do is go back in time though, so we can kind of tell the story on how you got to where you are right now. Um, can you remember day one on a bicycle, like training wheels on training wheels off? Like, did you, did you go straight and couldn't turn? I, I mean, everyone's first day on a bicycle is different. There's good ones and bad ones. I, how, how was yours? Um, I remember a little bit of learning how to ride. Uh, I was a bit older, actually, which is kind of funny. I was seven when I learned how to ride a bike. And a lot of kids learn younger than that. There's even kids you race who are four and five. Yeah. So I was a little bit late to learn how to ride. But I remember on the first day, uh, I remember I crashed and I got all scraped up in the street because, you know, you learn how to ride without training wheels and you fall over. And I got all scraped up on my elbow. And I just remember crying and being upset. Um, but obviously it didn't stop me from going and trying again. That's rad. I, I mean, I, I think back to my kids, it was like, as soon as I could possibly get them to have enough balance, even my daughter, it was like, go. And for you, you're talking seven years old. I mean, what were you, why not before that? Why even what inspired riding a bicycle? Because if you do it that late, it, something had to have inspired it at a different time than most. What, what, what was that inspiration? I don't remember what my thought process was at six, um, but I'm going to just assume that I just was. Yeah. What's the, hey, what's the story? What, what have you been told was the inspiration behind it? Um, I, I guess I just, but that was the age my parents decided to teach me. And up until then I had like a tricycle and, you know, stuff like that. But up, that was at the age where my parents were like, all right, you're getting a little bit older. You need to learn how to ride a bicycle. You haven't learned yet. And so they started getting me to learn. And um, I guess, I, I mean, I do remember as soon as I, I started riding, I loved it. Like I would ride around in the street until the lights came on and my parents made me come inside. And um, once I got a little better, I would like jump off the curbs and pop wheelies and stuff like that. Um, but it, it was just like, it, it clicked. Yeah, I played other sports as a kid. I played flag football and soccer and t-ball and all that. But for some reason, I just rem and I remember like, the bike was just my favorite. Like I'd get home from soccer practice and ride my bike. Do you, okay, so this is, um, this is gonna be relate to everybody that I know in moto. Um, Cause I did other sports, other people I've talked to that raced at other sports too. But I feel like some people just gravitate towards an individual sport where it's all on them. For me, it was that way. I remember playing basketball in like sixth grade and our team would get worked and I would, I would feel so bad, but I was like, it's not, this isn't like I got worked, we got worked. And I didn't like that feeling. I like to be on my own to where when I won, I won. And when I lost, I lost. It, was that, is that you too? Cause I feel like these individual sports people and it's not just moto and, or BMX, it's, it's U, UFC fighters. There's something about the DNA where it's like, I want it. I want all the control on me on how I'm going to do here. I don't want to rely on the goalie or the center to, to help, you know, me feel success or failure. Is that the same with you? Uh, well, I'll share a story that'll kind of tell you exactly uh, what, what you're thinking. So your black <laughs> football nine. team must've got worked. <laughs> I was, <laughs> no, it's even better. I was okay. nine and uh, <clears throat> I was playing like, rec league basketball and, and you know how it is when you're a kid everybody plays an equal amount of time no matter how good you are it's it's supposed to be fair and we were losing by a couple of points and there's a minute or two left and the coach subbed me out for somebody that I thought I was better than and I told the coach no and um the coach was like you've had your time Connor it's little Johnny's turn and I said, no, I'm bet I said to the coach, like, no, he sucks. I'm better than little him. Johnny can't shoot the ball coach. Right. <laughs> and so then the coach got mad and, uh, I, I guess, uh, 
I threw a tantrum and I sat down in the middle of the court and refused to get off. Oh my, my, dad, my dad had to walk out on the court and pick me up and I got in trouble. Like he had to like a little, like a little off. lion cub. Did he grab you by the back of your neck and pull you off? The court? And in that moment, he was like, all right, individual sport for you, son. I was already riding at this point. Um, but he was like, individual sport is going to be uh, best for you on the flip side. Um, I think it would be amazing to have the experience of winning with a team and, and having that like brotherhood, but like you were in sixth grade, I was nine. I think you have to push through the younger ages and the younger levels to get to college or pros when everybody cares and everybody's oh, yeah. working just as hard as you. But when you're younger and there's, you know, you're playing baseball and kids are picking daisies. Uh, it's kind of, kind of hard to, <laughs> to get into it. Yeah, how'd you guys do? Well, we lost because three of the kids left to go to the snack bar in the sixth right. inning. It's like, yeah. all right, well, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll give you one quick story on my team sports. Uh, I would say the the end of it. I did a little bit of everything. Baseball was one, and I and I I kind of liked it. It was you know throw a ball, catch a ball, hit a ball. Uh, in one game, it was the first year a kid pitch. I got hit with a pitch, and then like the next inning, I was playing second base, and a grounder popped up and hit me in the face, and I walked. From that hit, I walked straight off the field to the car, and I told my parents, I am not playing this sport anymore. Did a little bit of other things along the way, but, at the, but for me, that was like, that was at least the end of baseball. When you get jacked twice in one game, you're like, you know what, I'm going to go get jacked riding a dirt bike. That's. I was just going to say, yeah, because riding a dirt bike is that much safer than baseball. It is, yeah. I, I talk about, I, I should have known better, but uh, my medical file with dirt bikes is a lot worse than my baseball file. But right. Uh, anyway, so at that younger age, then you get on a bicycle. When mm -hmm. did when did it go from riding at night, you know, jumping off curbs to going to the track and being competitive and being like, okay, I want to, you know, when did the when did the switch flip for you and you became like I would say motivated to do something with what at this point was just fun. Um, I was always competitive from the time I began. Like I wasn't the kid that would go and get third and just be happy that I'm riding and got a trophy. I'd be mad that I didn't get first. Um, so I, I pretty much was competitive right off the bat. As soon as I started riding, my mom found a flyer advertising a local BMX track at a bike shop. Um, I don't remember why we were there. I had a flat tire or something was going on and my mom um, saw the flyer, so we, we drove out to the local racetrack and watched it. And then the next week we tried it and that was it. Like I just started riding. Um, I was lucky that I had parents who were supportive and gave me opportunities. They would drive me, at first it was around the state, racing the state level. And then eventually we'd go to California and Arizona and places like that to race. And um, I advanced pretty quickly and um, I had a natural knack for it. You know, my, my parents figured out and other people figured out right off the bat. And uh, yeah, I kind of was all in right, right from the get-go. You know, there's a, a, a time in every sport where it goes from, you know, fun, rec league, uh, you know, the local BMX track or the local race, you know, the mm -hmm. fairgrounds type race to where all of a sudden it's like becoming more real. Like there's like, there's like a path that becomes like, hey, you could actually go to college because you're good at this or you could become a pro. Was there an age for you when you started looking, I'd say, beyond what's right in front of you and going like, hey, hey I think I could be really good at this, uh, maybe even one of the best? It, where, where does that transition happen in BMX and, and did it hit you at that exact time? Um, so for me, like, I was pretty good when I was young, when I was like 9, 10, 11, and then I didn't grow. I was like the smallest kid. I grew late. So for me, when I was like 12, 13, 14, I struggled because I wasn't as physically big or strong and we don't have an engine. We are the engine. And when you look at 13 year olds, some of them have started puberty. Some of them haven't. So I'm this scrawny little kid racing against guys a foot taller than me who are significantly stronger. And then when they pedal and I pedal, they're just going to go away. They're going to ride. Away. Yeah. Big, big legs, strong mm -hmm. legs, cranking it. And he hears you spinning like, so maybe the talent's yeah. getting, buried by the physical traits a little that's what happened um and it was a kind of a hard time because i was good when i was a kid and i had some results when i was young and then all of a sudden the results fell for a few years and at that point in time i had no thoughts that i was ever going to make like quote unquote make it um as well as we didn't get put into the olympics until 2005 was when they announced that 2008 
would be the first Olympics. So when I was a kid and I started out, there was no long-term thought process of this. Like, sure, I wanted to be a pro, but we didn't have the opportunities we have now with the Olympics as well as now there's college scholarships and there's other opportunities that didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, I did it purely because I loved it. But I would say when I was 15 uh, and the first Olympics happened and I watched it on TV at like, I don't know, three in the morning, I, wa I, was, I watched it on TV in my room. And that was when it was like, all right, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I want to do this. And that was when like the, um, the switch flipped and I started trying and training and taking it a little bit more seriously. And that was around age 15, which I think is a great age to kind of start taking things a little more seriously. Um, you know, if you do it at 12, you burn out pretty quickly. Uh, but I think 15 was a good age because it was like, it was from within. It was myself. I was motivated to go and practice and do extra stuff and start working out and things like that. Um, so around 15. And then the following year in 2009, um, <clears throat> I turned 16 and I was like age eligible to begin racing at World Cups, which is the highest level of comp that we have after the Olympics. And I did my first World Cup. And I had like such low expectations. Like if I would have made the top 64, which is the round of eight heats, like I would have been stoked. That was my goal. Um, and I actually got third overall. And that set a record that is still around for like the youngest rider to ever podium at a World Cup event. But it was that race that kind of was like, okay, I can do this. Like I got a shot. I just beat half the Olympic field when I'm 16. So that was kind of the, the moment that I was like, all right, this could be real. So that was, that's when it goes from, I believe I could maybe be good to, whoa, I, I, I'm better than I think. Like I should be good from here. That was like the turning point for you confidence wise. Yeah. And not to say I didn't struggle with confidence at other points and you know, it, it always ebbs and flows and goes up, up and down. And um, especially when you're young like that, every race feels like the end of the world. Um, you don't have the perspective to understand that one bad race isn't going to kill you. You know, when you're, when you're 16 and you have a bad race, you know, sky is falling. Um, so there's a bit of that, but it was, that was kind of the, the turning point for me. That was like, okay, you're pretty good to, you actually have a shot at this. If you apply yourself and you, and you do the necessary work. Um, and that was, that was a, a good time. Cause then it was, it, it motivated me and inspired me. And I learned from that. And I also kind of, you know, success is one of those things where once you get it, you want more of it. It's like a drug. It's winning it is, is the best drug in the world. And when I got that first kind of hit, then I just wanted more. That makes sense. Um, I'm going <clears> to <throat> ask you kind of a, a question for Let's just go to that age group, say, let's go six years old to 15. Right? When you're kind of still a kid, you're transitioning into a little, uh, 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 an adult. You know, I, I talked to a lot of the parents that I might, well, first off, a little backstory. My son races. Um, my buddy, Eric, his son races BMX. I got all these dads I talk to about their kids all the time. And we've kind of come up with this, I guess, metaphor where there's a boat that's pulling a wakeboarder and we're trying to figure out who is the boat that's pulling this thing and kind of dragging the wakeboarder and who is the wakeboarder who's being pulled as far as a parent and a kid. W what do you think about that transition is it come for different ages where the kid is maybe the one pulling he's the boat and you're just trying to keep up with this determined motivated kid or is it where the parents are the boat and they're dragging their kid along like come on buddy just kind of take me through your thoughts of that metaphor on that transition where someone would go from the parents being the push versus the kids being the push because i see it at different ages i see six-year-old kids where the parents can't keep up with the kid he's so driven then I see some where the dads are at like 13, like, come on. And the kid's just being pulled. Like, I, just kind of take me through your thoughts. I know you approach the mental side of things a little bit differently. Um, just that kind of metaphor for that age group, because I, I'm, I'm going through it hard right now. I got a little yeah, guy who, I got a little guy who he verbally wants it, but I, I mean, I feel like I'm the one dragging this thing all the time and, I, and I, I'm ready to take a back seat and let him be the boat. And I, and I don't know when that's going to happen. So just kind of, I, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think you you obviously are going to have to treat it differently based on if you're dealing with an eight-year-old versus a 15-year-old. Um, like you said, it's great when the, the kid is the motivated one and he wants to go and put the extra work in. He wants to do, he wants to do everything. Um, 
when they're younger, I think it should be a bit of a balance. Like the parents should definitely encourage it and motivate. And sometimes they would have to be the boat. But then at the same time, I think, and I'm sure you've seen it in your world, when the parents are too gnarly of a boat, it just makes the kid not want to wakeboard anymore. Yeah. No, sometimes the dads are speed boats and the kids on the tube in the back just <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's not, that's not good. good. So there has to be some, some sort of balance where the parents are like, hey, you know, if you want to go to this race that I know you want to go to, you need to do a little bit of work. Because then it comes in like, and I'm sure you deal with this too. I have friends of mine um, who have 14, 15, 16 year old kids and they complain all the time. They're like, the kids don't realize I'm spending thousands of dollars to take them to this race. Go do some workouts, like get ready for this race because you're going to go, you're going to get smoked and then you're going to be mad that you got smoked, but you did no preparation to get there. And I just lit thousands of dollars on fire. And so, you know, it's one of those things where you don't want to like be so hard that your kid hates the sport and your kid could end up hating you uh, because you're too hard on him. But then at the same time that I think the kid needs to learn, you got to put some work in. And for me, I, uh, I didn't ever really train until I was about 13, I would say was the age that I started to train. Um, and for me, it was just that, like, my parents always were like, hey, you should probably go train. Or if I got smoked, they'd be like, well, little Johnny worked harder than you. He goes and does his extra, extra laps after you go home. And they tried to teach me that way, but the penny kind of dropped at 13 where I was like tired of losing. And it was like, all right, well, I guess I better start putting some work in if I don't want to lose anymore. But I don't envy parents who have to make that decision of if they want to, how hard they want to push their kid. As it's, it's like, cause you're dad, you're not supposed to be coach, but in some of these sports, you end up being dad and coach. Whereas wow. like if, if you if your son played football, you just drive him to and from practice and the coach is the, the, the one yelling at him and screaming at him. And you just, you know, how was practice son? Like, I love you. Like that's, you know, it's a totally different thing here with, with our sports because dads have to be coached too. It, that's what it is for me. I, I am the coach. And obviously with my background racing my whole life and what I do now, I feel like I'm somewhat of an encyclopedia for this sport. And I have a kid who I could, you know, give all that to. But then on some days he wants to play on his phone and play Legos. And then some days he's begging me to go ride. And you know what I mean? I'm dealing with an, a very inconsistent commitment. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to do what you said and balance and be like, you know, push when it needs a push. And then sit back and sometimes make him beg for it a little. It, it's just, it's a game, but I, I kind of like the way you're saying it. You got to get through puberty before you really understand what you're going to be, right? Because I think as a person, you, you, you make a big transition from kid to teen. And all of a sudden, teen, you're influenced by girls and success and being cool. All of a sudden, you want to be better. When you're a kid, I think it's just like whatever mood you're in. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're just into it. And then sometimes you're like, you don't even want to go. Yeah. So, uh, and I deal with a lot of, it's not just me, a lot of our dads, we have, we have a group text called the pissed off dads club. And there's like six of us and all of our kids race. And most of the time we're just talking crap, not on our kids, but just on kids in general. Like, hey, guess what mine did today? Guess what mine did? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh my God, these kids. You guys, uh, so my dad used to have a group of friends at the races and the dads would alternate telling us stuff about the track or about our bikes or whatever because no one would listen to their own dad but we never listen to other dads so like if my dad I mean, this is you know when i was a bit older 13 14 15 if my dad wanted to tell me something he would go to my friend's dad that he was friends with and say hey go tell connor this and then he would come over and i would listen to him but if my dad had said the exact same thing i'd have been like get out of here dad why why do we do that because i was the same way and now my kid does it i have to tell I have to tell my kids' friends to tell him, hey, there's a better line. I've told him three motos in a row. I'll have to go to his little 11-year-old yeah. buddy and say, hey, can you go tell him the outside's faster there? And then he'll <laughs> do it. And I'm like, what is your problem with me, Evan? Like, I, I told you that, but he won't listen to me. What, why, why do human beings not listen to their dads? I don't know. I teach, I teach riding schools occasionally, and there'll be times when I'll like, teach a kid something and the kid will make a breakthrough. And the dad will come up to me and be like, I've told him that 50 times. So thanks for finally getting him to listen, getting him to listen and do it. It's 
it's uh, a big mystery. I think it's a, it's a mystery with these kids and then they probably grow again. I feel dumb now growing up. I'm like, I, would, I wish I would have listened more, but anyways. Um, so back to your story. Now you say that at that age of 15, 16, it gets real serious. That's when you can officially qualify. You come out on fire. What was that like for you at that age where you're all of a sudden like becoming, I mean, well noticed, well recognized, beating on people but you're still at an age where, I mean, you're, you're a kid, you're a teenager. What was it like for you to start having, I, I'd say, the attention while still being at that age? Because even like a Jet Lawrence or a Hayden Deegan, all these kids, they're young to start getting a lot of attention and fame. And I'm just curious of how you process that at, at that age. So one thing that I, I didn't help me, um, I, I went to regular high school. And so on the weekends, you know, I would sign autographs and people would take pictures and I would have that attention. But then on Monday, my math teacher didn't care. And so it, <laughs> it, it kind of helped out a little bit uh, as far as keeping me grounded. And then as well as like, I had my friends from racing and, and all that, but I also had my friends from school and people I'd hang out with at home and they would say, oh, how's BMX? And then that would be the extent of our conversation about BMX. And we would be talking about chicks or the football game on Friday or whatever. So I think that kind of really helped me just having that balance and not being like too much too soon. But then at the same time, and I would tell Jet this or, or, or Hayden this, being the young up and coming guy with a hype is the most fun part of your career. That's the best part. <laughs> hey, it gets worse when you get older. It, cause and I feel like it's the same in all sports, but it goes, you go in this cycle where when you're coming up, all the hype, all the expectation, you're new, you're fresh, everybody loves you. You win a bit and then everybody wants to see you fall. But then if you stay with it and you keep winning long enough, look like a Tom Brady or Kobe Bryant, by the end of it, everybody loves you. So you go through this cycle where they love you, they hate you, they love you again. And once you have that expectation and that pressure, it's hard to have that like kind of free flowing fun that Hayden or Jed is getting to enjoy right now. So like for me at that age, it was great because I had the world at my feet, you know, I was 17 years old, 16 years old. And um, I was driving to school on Monday after making a few thousand bucks on the weekend, you know, and getting a box of free stuff. Like life was good. And, and it was a lot of fun. And I, when I was younger and it's, I guess the same for most young kids, no matter what you do, I couldn't wait to get older. And then you get older and you're like, damn, I wish I would have enjoyed being younger. Them late teen years, man, can be good if you just enjoy them. You know, you, you hear like uh, pro and NBA or NFL players always say, man, I wanted to go pro so quick. I wanted to make that money. I want to get in and make the money. And then they always say, man, I wish I would have stayed in college longer because nothing feels as good as that college atmosphere when you're, you know, in the, in the sweet 16 in, in college basketball, or, you know, you're in Alabama and you're playing in front of a hundred and something thousand fans. And now you got to go and it's a job and you're getting rid of, I, you always hear them say that they always say, I wanted it early. And then now I wish I would have enjoyed that part better because that's when it's just like, sorry, low bat. We're all good. Um, that's when it's like at its best, right? Like the expectations are high, but they're achievable. And you're just, everyone loves you and wants you. And then all of a sudden, when it becomes a job and obligation, you got a team manager or someone breathing down your neck. It's not the same as when you were just on top of the world. So I, I just, that's a funny period right now. And I'm, I'm watching Jet Lawrence and I'm like, man, it, it couldn't even be any cool. I actually went to his championship party after Hangtown. His, his party he's, at Top Golf because he can't get in anywhere because he's 18. Well, that's what it was. I said, I'm surprised you guys went here. You know, there's a Chuck E. Cheese right down the road. We could have went there for you, buddy. But you should see this kid. He literally, like you talk to him and he don't even know. I don't even know if he knows what he's doing all the way or what's what's happening with him in the world. He's he's still like a kid. And like, it's just got to be so good right now because it's not going to be that way forever. Look at Tomac and Roxon and Webb. Yeah, they still win, but they suffer now. And I don't think Jet suffers, maybe physically on his road bike rides, but I would say emotionally, there's not much suffering going on until you probably get in your 20s, right? Yeah, well, it, it's not as much, I don't think, like a specific age. It's when you have that expectation. And I don't just mean from the team managers, your sponsors, but ultimately like within yourself. And, and Eli or Cooper or Ken, 
Of course, they have a lot of expectation on them from the people around them, but they expect to win. They expect to be the champion every single time that they're out there. And not to say that Jet doesn't, but he's still in that phase where it's like, this is a cool track. I've never been here before. This is fun. I'm going to go and I'm going to go and have some fun. Hey, bro, how you doing, brother? Like, you know, <laughs> it's just a totally different ballgame when Eli, it's like, if I don't win, this is going to be a miserable week, you know, and it's just, uh, it's, it's a fun phase and he should enjoy it. And um, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully he can add a little bit of personality the way Plessinger and some of these other guys have kind of hung on to that as it, as they age and get a little bit older, but time will tell. But I think it's also a credit to the people around him that they're just allowing him to be a kid because he's not had a normal childhood and no Mm -hmm. top motocross athlete or top athlete in general has a normal childhood. So any of those elements that you can allow for them to be a 16, 17, 18, 19 year old kid, allow them to be that. Because when they put the helmet on, you gotta be a 30 year old. You gotta put an old head in a young body when you're when you're out on the track i like that old head and a young body i'm gonna i might have to use that at some point in uh, my my commentating so i'll give you i'll give you credit for it though because that was <laughs> that's a great line um where did that where do you think that happened with you that transition from dude i love the attention i love this is great to expectations and obligations and now like i have to win where did the pressure kind of change to where it's like i want to win now i have to win like where do you think that happened for you i mean i would say like i won my first ever major event in 2011 my first world cup and once you win one then you know how it feels and you know how good that you can be then every time after that when you don't win you're wondering why you didn't win and now now at this age, I can think like, it's not realistic to win everything. Of course, you're going to have off days. Other people have good days. But then when you're 19, it's a lot harder to think that. You're like, oh, I won one. Cool. I'm going to win every race for the rest of my life. Like, that's kind of how I felt. Um, so I was, I was 19 when I got that kind of self-expectation on me. And that was right before London, the first Olympics I competed in. Um, and I, I went into that event wanting to win, but also like, thinking that I was going to win. Um, and I was one of the favorites, but there was definitely other guys that were talented and good as well. Um, and when I went to London, um, I was the youngest athlete in our event that was competing. And uh, I won my heats. I won my semi. I was the number one seed into the final. And <clears throat> I remember before the final saying to my coach, I'm going to F and win. I'm going to win. And then I blew it. Like I didn't win. And so in that, that was kind of the experience, you know, it was really hard. Like anytime you're the one seed at the Olympics and you take seventh, you don't even get a trophy. You get a participation certificate, which is what you get if you get fourth or worst at the Olympics. Um, That was kind of the moment that I learned, like I learned a lot, but that was the one where I learned like the expectation shouldn't be on what place I get. It should be that I'm going to do my best, compete my best, prepare my best and do my best. And so that was a, and it wasn't an overnight shift. It was a, took years to kind of shift that whole thinking to I'm going to do everything I can to put myself in a position to win rather than I'm going to win. Um, Cause I got too far ahead of myself in that moment and I had a shot to win. And if I could put the old head on the young body and go back, I think I could probably win that race, but I wasn't ready for it. And so that was kind of like the growth event over the next year or two of learning how to like, focus on this sounds so cheesy and I hate this term, but focus on the process and not the outcome. Um, but then at the same time, like, I'm sure you've heard that before process, mm-hmm. not outcome. It's unrealistic for high level athlete, not to think about the outcome, but you got to remember it's, that's what you work for, right? You work for the outcome, but then at the same time, it's like, you don't want to be in the starting line thinking about winning. You want to be in the starting line, thinking about nailing your start, hitting your marks, hitting your lines, you know, doing the things you want to do on the course rather than being in the starting line thinking, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. It'd be like Michael Jordan at the free throw line just thinking, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swish the shot instead of just thinking, take a deep breath, bend your knees, follow through, and thinking about the things that are going to help them nail that shot. So that was kind of my like growth period, I guess, 2012, 13, when I kind of had to go through that, that I, I kind of quote unquote grew up. 
That makes sense too. It, it might, it takes, it's hard to learn those things until something happens that forces it sometimes. Yep. You know what I mean? It's like, you can read all you want, but until it actually happens to you, you don't really know how to make it. You don't know how to take the feeling and do something with that feeling. So um, would you consider that to be one of your personal biggest letdowns then where you felt like you were supposed to win, gonna win, and then didn't? Does that, and obviously crashes play into that, but I'm saying like just a performance, did you feel like a letdown to that? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, as an athlete, you can always look back at races and be, oh, I would have done this different if I would have done this different. Um, obviously, the Olympics is the biggest event that we have. And I was a one seed in the final, so clearly I had a shot to win. Um, but in hindsight, I'm actually glad I didn't because I learned so much that helped me for the rest of my career. And I also worry that if I had won the absolute pinnacle, I don't want to say easily because I worked hard, but in such a short period of time, it would have been really hard for me to kind of process that. I was, I was 19 years old. I've been professional. You have to be 18 to be professional in BMX. So I've been pro for a year and a bit, and I just go straight to winning the biggest ticket item that you could possibly win. And I don't think it would have been good for me long-term to win that. So as much as I wish I would have in some ways, I'm also completely glad and okay that I didn't win it because it helped me with the next one and with every race after that. That's why I always say you got to learn how to lose mm -hmm. and learn that a loss can be a win depending on how you process it, you yeah. know, and what you do with it and how you take that moving forward. And that makes, uh, that makes total sense. Uh, on the flip side, what would be you, you what would be, Winning a different events obviously has different pri or not priority, but different height based on the event, the Olympics being one. But if you were to think back in your career, what would be a win that you got? It could be at a, a small level that you feel really was a, 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 a benefit to you mentally, emotionally, that kind of did the opposite of that loss where you got a lot out of that win too. And it doesn't have to be the Olympics, but is there a day that you remember where a certain win, something you overcame was like, that might've been my best win. Um, it actually was the Olympics and not just because it was the Olympics. So I broke my wrist four months before the Olympics and I only made the team on a discretionary rule nomination thing. Like, uh, I couldn't compete in the final events and the trials and all that stuff. And I actually had to race it with a wrist that was still broken. Um, and I got surgery again afterwards, but for me, like, Obviously what happened in 2012 was really hard. So I struggled for the next few years after that with like those big moments, those clutch moments, whether it was national championships, world championships, just major, major events. Um, I didn't trust myself that I could pull the trigger in those key, key moments. And so there was a number of times in between 2012 and 2016 when I was up for a championship and I was really close and I couldn't quite just mentally, because it wasn't the physical that was letting me down. It was mental. I couldn't quite get over that hump to pull the trigger and win. And I worked with a sports psychologist for that four years. I read books. Like all I wanted was to be clutch, to make that game winning shot, to, to figure out what do I have to do? Because it's, I'm not getting beat because I'm physically not good enough. I'm getting beat because I lose a couple percent in that final moment or Some, they, something something's bringing you down a level to your best and you didn't know what it was exactly and so when i went to the olympics which is obviously the biggest one that we have and i went the complete opposite direction and i absolutely nailed it i had like a hundred percent of what i'm capable of got out on the table that was a huge turning point for me and i went on and like the biggest championship that we have in america um we have it every year. It's like a series that we race, USA BMX series. I'm sure the dad you mentioned, Eric, I'm sure yep. he's involved with that. So before Rio, I had gotten second and third in that championship, second or third, four times. I was always up for the championship, but I could never seal the deal. After Rio, I won it three of the next four years. And I started like, I wouldn't say it's, e it's easy at this point, but now when you put me in those high pressure situations, I'm so confident. And I, I, I haven't, blown that I can think of off the top of my head. I haven't blown a high pressure event really since 
then. So it was a huge turning point in my career where I went from really close to when the pressure's on, he's going to deliver. And it wasn't just the event. It was also the work I did for those four years kind of leading up to that event with reading and studying and then the sports psychologist, things like that. Um, but that would for sure be the biggest kind of turning point in my career. And do you think that that one right there too is what gave you the confidence after that almost like you had control over your mind? Like you, Because being clutch is, I think, the word clutch. You're having control over your emotions and probably a control over the things that make you doubt yourself, right? You always... You believe in yourself, but there's these little doubts that creep in. And I feel like with clutch, those are gone now. It's like, I know I, I can do this now. Do you feel like that's what it was? Is once you got that first one, you got yourself over the hump, you were like, oh, I, 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 I can control myself a little bit better from here on out. And once you had that control and the confidence that control, you think that's what's carried it since? Yeah, I think, like you said, like sometimes you just have to do something to prove it to yourself that like you can do it. And it kind of squashes the doubts and the uncertainty of, you know, when you're lining up in the starting line and you're like, am I going to pull this off? Can I do it? Like, that's not a good way to be thinking, right? You want to be, you want to be thinking like, like I said, the process, like I'm going to nail this start. I'm going to hit every line that I want to hit. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to win this race. It's a much better and healthier thought process than like, I hope this works out. Like I'm going to try really hard. And it was just that belief that you got from doing it, that I got from doing it once that kind of carried on. And then it was almost compounding. Like then the next time I did it, that was clutch. It was great. And then the next time, and then it just keeps building to where like at this stage of, of my career, I've been in 20 plus situations that are high, high pressure championships on the line, national world, Pan American, whatever it is. And I don't feel nervous about them anymore. Like I feel completely comfortable in them. And if anything, I get more focused because I, I know what to do. So that was a big change in my career. And I also going back to London, I don't know if it would have happened if London wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So losing that one helped me and forced me to get better at that because you know, some people are naturally clutch, right? You guys always talk about it in your broadcasts. Oh, he just got the clutch gene. Not everybody, and maybe I have some natural ability, but I had to work to get mine. It was effort to get mine. And for me, it was, it was kind of good to kind of learn how to do that, to feel like now I still prepare or I still compete like I have that natural clutch gene. Right. Um, Two more questions for you. Um, I know you've worked with riders in Supercross on the mental sides of things. Um, how do you process being now on the delivering advice instead of going to a sports psychologist, reading the books? Now you're on the side where like you, you've got a lot of this figured out and you can share that info. Um, how is it like that for you? And again, getting into the minds of a dirt bike rider, it's similar with BMX. We're, we're very similar because we do a lot of the same things. But man, the, the, I'd say the mental side of this sport is squirrely, man. It's all over the place. So how do you now deliver the message needed to people that were, are in a position where you were, where they need, now they need the advice that you went and got and figured out. How do you deliver that message? Yeah, well, and um, I mean, obviously I help Christian, Craig, we can, we can talk about that. Um, the way that I kind of describe it is it's a little bit like a mentor. So Everybody, no matter what you do, what's what you, whether it's a sport, whether it's a, a trade, you know, what, whatever it is, everybody can benefit from somebody who's been there, done that, and can kind of help you out with the things you may not know. Um, the key is, and I think this is the key for any good coach in any situation, is you can't treat everyone the same, and you have to figure out and tailor to an extent what works for that particular athlete. So, what I need to hear what you need to hear as an athlete and what Christian needs to hear for the same message, we all might need to hear different things, right? Because some guys like to be yelled and screamed at and, and like, you know, someone to be a hard ass to them. Some guys need a little bit more, you know, Hey, you're going to be okay. Um, and you just got to say it in a way that it makes sense to that particular writer with their knowledge and their experiences. Um, so for me, like the first step, with him was 
like figuring out the best way to deliver the message and to tell him what he needs to hear, uh, but in such a way that he actually internalizes it. That's been the, 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 the key with him. But then at the same time, winning is winning. You know, and our sports are similar, like you said, but whether you're talking to a, a track and field athlete, a motocross athlete, a tennis player, the mindset of winning, there's similarities no matter what you're doing. And I think I will never tell him how to ride a dirt bike. That is not my forte. You know, I rode a dirt bike when I was a kid and, you know, I'm not going to ever tell Christian how to go through the whoops. He's got that part figured out. But yeah. if he's, if he's having a bit of a, a nervous moment before an event, Oh, you know, I'm stressed out about this or, Oh, well, the practice went bad. Blah, blah, blah. That's when it's somebody that you trust to tell you, Hey man, how many points get paid out in practice? Who cares that you're P5? Figure out where you went bad or figure out where you can make up the time. Focus on that and blank page. Start again. You know, that's where it becomes important to have someone that you trust that knows how to tell you what you need to hear to kind of get to that next step. Makes sense. Some need to be told, hey, pull your head out of your ass. Some need to be told, hey, no. You're, you're fine. Like, let's just focus on this one detail that might fix 10. You know what I mean? I, I've learned that too, just watching some kids and adults respond to, they, they need a little chewing. Uh, Jacob Hayes, one of my best friends, he told me for him, he needs to be chewed out. He just needs to be reminded almost of like, come on, man. And then he's like, oh, okay, I'm good. Where some, it's like, it's not that, right? It might be one little detail in the brain that needs to be adjusted. And you don't do that one through force. You do that one through a little massaging or a little better understanding. And all of a sudden the whole thing cleans up, you know? So is that what I guess you've learned through all this is that everyone's an individual. They need to be treated what's best for them. And obviously you have to find that over time, right? You can't work with Christian Craig on day one and know him. Have you gotten to know him better and learn what makes him tick? Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, the first part of our, our work started out just getting to know each other, just hanging out, you know, like I'd go to the track with him and just watch what he does, you know, ask him some questions and kind of figure out the best way to get through to him. And you tailor it to an extent. Everybody needs to be told sometimes to get your head out of your ass. Everybody. But some athletes right before the main event need to be told like, let's effing go, let's go, yeah. let's get fired up. Others need to be told, hey, if this line develops in this way, do this. And there's something technical because then their mind goes technical and focuses on that instead of thinking about the other riders and the, the flames and the crowd and the points and they have something specific to focus on. Um, so just figuring out you know, what worked for him and, and what he needed to focus on within himself. And then also just kind of, Obviously, he's had some bad luck over the years. Um, some of it his fault, but a lot of it just freak accidents that, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of it for him has kind of been learning how to believe that you're not going to have that bad luck and that you can do it um, and to trust yourself. And that's been a lot of what we've kind of been working on is just trusting yourself ultimately because with him, it's never a question of um, technical ability. No, it's, it's been just like get out on the get 100 percent out on the on the on the track, get it all out, and mm -hmm. shifting your focus to just get it all out. And yeah, uh, it is funny. Me and his coach Swanapool um, over at Star, him and I see things eye to eye. We're good buddies. We talk on the phone all the time about him and and other riders, and we just we have the same mentality on things and. We just, he kind of vents to me if someone's kind of making him mad or we both vent about Christian, like, damn it, dude. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, it just, it, but it's good because in a sense, and this is something I learned from the Olympic, uh, Olympic team that they do, it's almost like a performance team, right? So Swanee will communicate with me if he sees something. I'll communicate with Swanee if I see something. Paige will, Paige will call me if she sees something. And we can all kind of work together behind the scenes because we're all going to get different views, right? Mm -hmm. Paige is going to see a different side of him than I'm going to see clearly. And when he's out at the track with Swanee, Swanee is going to be able to see a different thing than when we're on the phone on, on the drive home and he's calling me, telling me how great his day was and that, you know, he's going to win or whatever it is. Like, so we kind of work together on that, which is fun. 
That's rad. I mean, it's got to be fun for you too at the same time, especially when you're working with someone with talent pouring out of their ears. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but at the, the same the time, it's, it's, like, it's, it's quite interesting because I'm not, I, I, by no means, I'm not perfect as an athlete. And I've had great people along the way that have helped me. And it is funny when you're on the other side and it's like, what are you freaking out about, dude? Like, it's not a big deal. But then at the same time, like, because I've been there, and I think this is why I don't want to say it's easy for me, but like, I've been in his shoes. Like, I understand how he feels, not in the terms of racing supercross, but in the terms of contending for a championship you've been working for years for. Like I've the emotional there. side of the sport. I get that. I've been in that position. I understand what it feels like to line up in a starting gate thinking like, I have to get top three here. I have to get top three here. I understand that. So I also understand why he freaks out when he freaks out or why he feels a certain way he feels because I've done the exact same thing. But when you're on the flip side of it and you're just looking at it, you're like, what are you doing? Like, it's kind of funny. <laughs> and I'm sure you know the same thing. When you race, you had to freak out. And then when you're not racing, you're looking like, what are you, what are you worried about? It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's unfair sometimes how mm -hmm. it looks so different when you're the one doing it. And when you're the one watching it, it's like, it's not, it's not fair. Uh, last question for you. What's next for you? What, what do you want to accomplish? What do you feel like you can accomplish? Um, take me through the next, I mean, take me through the next 10 years. Like, where, where is your life going to go um, over the next decade, career-wise, personal-wise? I, I mean, you're at that stage now where you've done so much, but I know you're still competitive. So what, I mean, other than this injury that you're getting and working through, what do you, what do you still want to do? Yeah, so at the moment, my my main goal is to focus on this injury and um, I'm going to kind of wait and, and figure out what's next as far as racing goes. Once I get farther along in the, in this injury, you know, it's not an ACL that you can just say six months from now, you'll be good to go. Um, I have no idea like really how long it's going to be until I get clearance to resume risk behaviors again. And I think you could consider what we do as risk behaviors. Yep. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm going to go get some more brain scans in January to see how the areas of the brain that were bleeding, because I had three brain bleeds, um, are healing. And I'm going to kind of hold off until January and to kind of see what's next, because if they tell me you're good to go, well, then, all right, maybe at that point, cool, like, let's go. If they tell me it's more time, then I don't want to kind of be like, you know, not ready for that. So I'm just going to hold off as far as the, the racing stuff goes. Um, I do coach a couple of BMXers um, that I'm friends with uh, that I really enjoy. And I, I do see myself staying involved in BMX on that side of things. Um, but actually, funny enough, uh, when I'm done racing, so I, I signed with Wasserman in 2012. And I've been with them for about 10 years now. And ever since I signed with them and I went into their office for the first time, I thought being an agent was the coolest thing ever. And I, I, I remember when I was real young, I used to go in to see my agent there and um, I would stop by Jimmy Button's office and talk moto with him and be like, oh, where's so-and-so going? Where's so-and-so going? And um, I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And then I'd go to the next door and it was skateboarding and, and just, you know, I thought it was really cool. So uh, I actually changed my major in college to business management and uh, did an internship last year with my agent at Wasserman. I would like to graduate college. I do an internship and so I assisted him for uh, a semester. Um, so that's something I've always wanted to kind of get into when I'm done racing. And, um, you know, whether it's BMX, BMX freestyle, which is now in the Olympics, mountain biking, and then as well as moto, I've always had a passion for moto. That's kind of what I'd like to get into um, when I'm done with my racing stuff. That's rad. So uh, Lucas Myrtle doesn't rep you then? No, no, no. I met him uh, three or four years ago at Glen Helen, um, but my agent, his name is Brad Lusky. He started the family 20 years ago with Steve Astafin and oh, has been around for a long time. So that's, uh, that's my agent and that's who kind of brought me in. And then I met Lucas through him a few years ago. It's funny, it's its own little world in the agent world and how it all goes and all that. So I'm learning more about it now too because Jacob Pays was just hired. We had him on this show. Yeah. He was hired as a kind of an understudy to Lucas Myrtle as an agent there. And he's like, he's learning. <laughs> Let's just say oh, he's yeah. learning a lot right now. Yeah. I learned a lot of in my internship. That's for sure. 
Hey, Connor, this has been a great talk. Um, first off, I'm glad you're doing well. And that's the most important thing, right? And I look forward to seeing your progress and would love to meet you in person too. How about that? Let's, let's, let's try to meet up here at one of these West Coast Supercrosses. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I'm, I, if Christian's on the West Coast, I'll be at a few of them. If he's not, I'll still probably be at a few of them. So we'll get together for sure. Right on, man. Well, thanks again for coming on Beyond the Track and uh, I'll talk to you and see you soon. Awesome. Thanks. See ya.